Welcome back. Glad you're with us. We've been talking about Prop P. Uh, we've been talking about um, uh, John McCain earlier in the show and whether or not uh, he indeed um, has left the reservation. Uh, we don't know for sure, uh, but his vote on health care made me shake my head. That's for sure. Uh, but right now, speaking of a police, because last hour we talked about Prop P and funding and all of that, uh, we are joined by former uh, Ferguson uh, chief Uh, Tom Jackson, who, of course, has a new book out called Policing Ferguson, Policing America, and what really happened, what the country can learn from it. And he's fresh off uh, flying back from a worldwide media tour. Are your arms tired? (laughs) A little bit. I had to ask. (laughs) How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. It's great to see you. I'm glad you survived the view because I don't know if I could be that close to Whippy Goldberg and come out of it unscathed. It was... uh... It was not a not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> was it stressful to be there? Did you feel the tension in the air? Oh yeah, there's definitely tension in the air. They, it's not the view; it's their view. It's the, yeah. They, they bring you there to tell you <laughs> how they feel about things, and then they throw you out. Wow, so. wow. Um, you know, I've I've heard I've seen some of your interviews on the national media, I and mean, I think it's all gone well. The book is fantastic. I meant to bring my copy in today so I could have you autograph it for me, and I completely forgot. But um, you, you've laid out here in a way that in a in a way this story hasn't been told yet. I don't think what happened in those first few hours in Ferguson, now almost three years ago, that. That, that most people have never had an opportunity to realize because all you talk about is how all, all, all the media talked about was how long the Mike Brown's body laid there and the disrespect and the hands up, don't shoot. And why didn't you do something faster all through the lens of hindsight? And you, you lay this out so beautifully. I've enjoyed the book so far. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you do. I'm, I'm glad you picked it up and reading it. Um, the people that I've spoken to that have read the book that had a preconceived notion about what went ha- what happened, what went down in, in those months. Um, you know, they said that it really made them think, gave them a different point of view, a different perspective, and uh, and changed the way they thought about it. So I'm, I'm happy that it's having that kind of effect. Well, um, it, I know I know you. It, it's been received well from the people I've talked to uh, who've looked at it and, and some of the comments I've seen online about it. What is the, what is the feedback you're getting from – folks who've been on the other side of this because obviously when you've been on these talk shows you're talking to some of these hosts who have a who have completely degraded the city of ferguson in the last three years uh and what happened there D- have you opened did you get the impression talking to them that you were able to change any minds about what happened yes i did As good matter of fact i was on a show in, in new york city with this young lady it's called metro focus you know so um you would expect that it, it would have a um, you know, the liberal sort of slant to it and so forth. And uh, the, the young lady that I was speaking to, an African-American woman, uh, said that she had read the book prior to the interview, which I thought was really cool that she did that. Sure. And that uh, it, it changed the way she thought about everything. And, uh, you know, it gave her a different perspective. And, and uh, it, we had a great interview. You know, it was just uh, – uh, so I, w- I was happy that that happened. And as a matter of fact, it's been listed – uh, a couple of times in the last few days is the number one new release in African American studies. Oh wow! Which kind of tells me that that I'm reaching not just you know the audience that uh, that agrees that that uh, you know there were a lot of bad actors in government and media, but but who may <laughs> not agree with me prior to this, but now they're reading the book, and so it's it's at least at least it's reaching out there. Well, you know, I felt there were a couple of places where people were getting an unfiltered view of what happened in Ferguson, but for the broader audience in America, they got a filtered view of what happened in Ferguson. And the filter was, was through the people that came to town and kind of stole the narrative, right? The, 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 uh, um, uh, Jesse Jackson and, and former, the former attorney general, Eric Holder, and these folks who, twisted this thing into something that it wasn't and if you weren't here listening to 97 one or some of the local folks who who had ears in ferguson and were talking to the police this is going to be breaking news for them what you've written here yes it really will and and i did give a shout out to 97 one in the book awesome um, thank but, you uh, <laughs> because you're right you know it, it was uh it was what was really happening so the, the filter that you're talking about that that people were seeing was um, a white police officer murdered an unarmed black man, 
12 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon in a densely populated area for no reason while his hands were in the air surrendering. Now, that, that doesn't make any sense to most people that I've talked to that something like that would happen. But to a lot of people, they believed it right away. And that became the narrative. And because of the effects of social media and, and slanted media, we weren't ever able to get in front of that narrative. So what we ended up with is getting an extreme makeover. Uh, it had people come in from all over the country and, and even the world, descended upon Ferguson. And then the media came in from outside and discovered this terrible problem occurring among these people that didn't live there. And that became the story. So it, it didn't have anything to actually do with Ferguson, the, the people that live there and work there. But, um, yeah, that, that became what it was. You know, as as a police officer, you, for for how many years were you an officer? And um, 31 years with St. Louis County and five with Ferguson. So, so 36. Thir- 36 years. During that period of time, you have to develop some trust in the system. You have to believe that as you arrest people and crimes work their way through the system, you have to believe in in the outcome of those of the system of what whether somebody's charged or charges are dropped or they're found guilty or innocent or whatever you have to put your faith in that was that belief shaken when you saw the FBI stream into town the department of justice and kind of how this thing was taken over because ultimately they weren't able to find they weren't able to reach a different conclusion than the one you guys had reached but then they brought in the the civil rights side of it and they did reach their own conclusion right and and i i differentiate between the fbi and the rest of the justice department because in my view um and and this was reinforced by by their conclusion the fbi is the finest investigative body in the world um largely uncorruptible, and they work with blinders on. I have no no, uh, no idea that if, if they had thought that uh, this was an unjustified shooting, and if Bob McCullough had thought it was an unjustified shooting, they would have said so. Um, that's They have that kind of integrity and honesty, and it had nothing to do with anybody what anybody from the outside thought, uh, and they weren't going to bend anybody's political pressure. On the other hand, the, uh, the civil litigations unit of the Justice Department was really uh, – Eric Holder's sword. It was his political arm. And they bring them in there to um, to take down police departments. That's what, that's what they did. Right. Well, not just the police department, but the city, the, the, city, the, the courts. I mean, they wanted a lot of things changed. Forced signature on that consent decree, even right. though the city expected it was going to cost cash for them to do that. They told him, sort of like I've, I've been told the FBI will do in a case like that, they'll bring you in, they'll charge you, and they'll basically say you're either going to plead guilty to this or it's going to get a lot worse for you. Yeah, that's essentially how that whole process works. And and police chiefs from around the country got a hold of me when we they first said they were going to do a pattern and practice investigation. And they told me, you know, they've already reached their conclusion. This is not an investigation. This is just them. They're going to dig through your trash and uh, whatever other, everybody else's trash too, and just find something to blame on you. And and what they're going to do is come up with a finding that makes you look in the worst possible light, and then they're going to force you to make corrections for things that may not even need to be corrected. Um, and I, I pointed out to DOJ, I didn't realize that they were going to ignore all, anything exculpatory. Right. But there was a a survey done of Ferguson in May of 2014 by the University of Missouri St. Louis and in that survey which survey which was extensive they found that uh, the police department in particular had a 76% good or excellent approval rating and then another 20% was fair so that's really really good for an urban uh, suburban police department yeah and of course that didn't really play into into what the the federal government decided to do once they got in there. No. And that's the sad part. And and here we are what uh, August middle of August is going to be 3 years, right? Right. Yeah, and night. so almost 3 years later, I know on the on the spot of the quick trip that burned to the ground that first or second night, uh the Urban League has built a building there and they they kicked off their big celebration the other night, their four-day conference in St. Louis with a news conference at that facility talking about trying to turn, you know, the, the a phoenix rising from the ashes is the way they described it. And I just, I had to shake my head because Ferguson was not ashes and it didn't need a phoenix until 
these outside forces came in and twisted this story into something that it wasn't. And it saddens me that three years later, there are folks still controlling the narrative about that town. They, they absolutely are. And that's, and that's a shame that people come out and say things like that. Because it was such a wonderful <clears throat> town before August of 2014. And then the people there, they continue to, uh, to strive to make that a great community. But you know, prior to that, it was, you know, just a great place to be. It had nine neighborhood associations that met regularly, you know, with us in the in the city, the government. And we had a 5K, 10K fun run, a twilight bicycle ramble, movies in the park in the summertime, um, a great parks, uh, parks department, and, you know, the oldest organic farm, the side of the Mississippi River, farmer's market, just everything really good about a community Ferguson had. So people came in and burned it. And if they want to say they burned it down and now they're rising back up out of it, that's just, that's insane. When you sat down to write your book, and again, we're talking to Chief Tom Jackson, the former chief of Ferguson, uh, policing Ferguson, policing America. I, I would suggest that this should be required reading for every law enforcement officer in America, particularly the chiefs, but even below that level, so they can understand uh, what you what you experienced in the first 48 52 hours of this thing were kind of spiraled out of control yeah i well i agree with you wish you had it i guess huh <laughs> yeah yeah I, I did wish i had that uh um but um the the uh the, the fact that this can happen to you and that politicians can turn their back on your police department immediately for their own benefit and that the media can just spin it any way they want to, and that optics matters more than anything else, and social media is a destructive force in a situation like this. Wow. Well, again, uh, the book is called Policing America, What Really Happened, What the Country Can Learn From It, and they can. I hope that they do. In fact, it's available on Amazon and Kindle and all of that. Have you got any more Noble. any more national media appearances scheduled? You get them all out of your system in one week. I, I think I got them all in my system in, in those few days. And I tell you what, I'm glad to be back in St. Louis. Yeah, I'll bet you are. Uh, Chief Jackson, always great to see you. Great seeing you. All right. Uh, get that book, and then we'll put a link to it up on the webpage there so folks can uh, find out where, where it is. And it's a great read. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to open your eyes. If you've listened to this show long, you've heard, you've heard some of – the truth but this kind of gets you on the inside of what was going on and 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 the lack of leadership they got out of jeff city when this was all i mean it was just amazing and it's a great read so do that i'll get some of your phone calls coming up 314-969-9797-866-455-9797 we're back in just a minute Mark Cox Show on FM News Talk 971, 987, AM 1490, and 971talk.com. Traffic reports at your fingertips. Real-time traffic online. Log on to 971talk.com for real-time traffic updates. Brought to you by Frankly to Acura. With 0.9% financing going on now. Can't beat Alita. Online at litaacura.com. You're going to get a 